Hello and welcome to the City Nature Challenge Nature Chat. Uh, over the bank holiday weekend, over 3,000 people were out snapping photos of nature on their doorsteps and sending them in via the free iNaturalist app for the International City Nature Challenge. This year, the challenge saw over 400 city regions across the world, including 14 in the UK, take part, working together to put wildlife on the map. And across the whole of the UK, there was an amazing over 54,000 wildlife observations made. The chance to take photos in the field is over now, but we do have a still a few days left to upload and process our sightings before the final tally is announced on Monday, May the 10th. So we're asking you to help out by identifying some of the unknown species that have been found and pick out some of the highlights from the weekend. So full instructions for how to take part in this can be found in the link in the video description. To help, we've been meeting live with UK wildlife experts this afternoon and I'm pleased to welcome our final NHA chat of the afternoon, um, Duncan Savell from the Natural History Museum. He's going to be talking about um, how to find and identify um, vertebrates in general. And so do put any questions in the comments uh, uh, you have about how to find and identify and record invertebrates. So Duncan, thanks for joining us uh, this afternoon. Um, mm -hmm. very Thanks for giving up your time. And can you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and uh, what groups you like to um, study? Yes, um, well, my, my, my job is I'm a curator at the Natural History Museum and uh, I am part of the fly section. So, um, you know, my, my sort of nine to five um, coronavirus uh, accepted is looking after fly collections in the museum. Um, and part of that is also making sure that the collection is accessible to people to uh, study. Um, now I've been in the museum for about eight years. So I've been looking at flies for, I think about 25 years now. And that came out of, um, some projects I was doing where I was looking at biodiversity and in those projects, I was actually focused on uh, birds and mammals. I, I used to, you know, after I graduated, I was looking at um, vertebrates and, you know, which is fine. Um, interesting groups, nice groups to look at. But when you get in, when you're looking at things from a biodiversity point of view, uh, there's a really small number of species there. Yeah. And if you think in terms of what's going on in the environment and the ecosystem and what's involved in biodiversity, they're actually quite a small part. So to carry on with biodiversity work, it was just obvious that you would need to look at insects or plants or you know, more species rich groups. And the, the, the more I looked at in, insects, the more interesting I, the more involved I got. They have very interesting uh, life histories. Um, there's lots and lots of scope for making new discoveries. Um, we have 24,000 plus, I think 30,000 plus invertebrates if you include the, the extra groups in, in Britain. Um, some are fairly well studied, some are not so well studied, but there's, there's lots of scope for um, finding out new things, making important records. And it was that sort of biodiversity link that got me interested in the start. Um, I volunteered at my local record center. Um, that was, that was my route into insects. And the, the guy there had a stack of crane flies that he'd been collecting for someone else and to identify that other person was quite busy. So when I went down to my record center and, and offered to volunteer, I was given immediately a, a, a bag of train flies in ethanol. Um, and uh, that's how I started looking at flies. And at, at the start, it was a little bit tough because the, the handbook to crane flies at the time was a 1950 handbook. Mm. The terminology was quite dry. It was outdated. There were very few illustrations. So when you're just starting and you're trying to identify material and you have these quite technical terms that you're not used to, and you have no illustrations or very few illustrations to back it up, that's a real struggle. Luckily, because I was in Edinburgh, I had access to the museum collection uh, there. So I could go, you know, if I had a day off, I could go into the museum and they have a great collection of insects. So you can compare what you've collected with what they've got. You can work through the, the key to understand what it actually means. Um, 
and there was also a crane fly expert based in Glasgow, which was not that far away. So, so gradually, um, you know, with the museum, with the local record centre, um, I, you know, was able to build up my knowledge and experience, and gradually started looking at other groups as well. Um, and that's um, so other other fly groups I would look at. It, it was really a case of if I was coming across something in the field when I'm looking for crane flies, um, and if I knew there was a, a a good key to them, then I would have a go at those. So for things like uh, Bibionid St. Mark's flies, you know, I, I would start looking at those. Uh, sepsids, which are the lesser dung flies, are the key to those. If you have a male septid, because they have these um, they have these teeth and spines on the forearms. So it's quite easy to identify a species of these lesser dung flies. Um, if you have a male um, and, you know, it, it advanced there, so to other groups. Uh, a few years later, when I um, went to do a PhD, I actually did a PhD on a um, beetle, a leaf beetle called the tansy beetle, which is only found in York and only found in Fens in Cambridgeshire. So there was a conservation aspect to, to that. Um, that was you know, just looking at one species, um, and looking at uh, movements and populations, but that got me into beetles a little bit as well. And um, then, you know, you know, later I've, there's some other groups I've, I've covered based on how often I see them in the field. Um, ants I've had a go at, um, I mean, uh, butterf some groups are very doable. Um, butterflies, um, shield bugs, they're good resources to things like this. Ladybirds, mm -hmm. they are easy to do because the resources are there. So it's it's been, a, with me, it's been a case of, um, you know, what I see, do I think I can I can tackle it um, sensibly um, and come up with a, you know, accurate identification. Oh, so you've done a little bit of everything then, and I... uh, I, yeah, <laughs> which, which has has its uh, there are pros and cons to that. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. So it it does mean that you you're in danger of not specialising in anything, and I I have found recently I was looking at some dung beetles last weekend, and because it's been a couple of years since I looked the last time I looked at a dung beetle, when I'm looking at them again. It does take a little bit of time to remind myself mm -hmm. of what what the characters are for dung beetles and and um, ultimately the the specimens I was looking at I passed on to someone else um, because I'm like okay okay like you know I've I think this is like either or species but because I've not done this for a while then I'm going to pass it on and uh, so, so someone else a colleague at the museum uh, looked at those and, and gave a a positive ID. Um, if I if I knew I was going to spend the next couple of weeks looking at dung beetles, mm. then it would be different. But that was the kind of we, we needed to grab dung beetles for a particular project um, because they wanted a, a DNA sequence of a dung beetle. So we went out and grabbed some. Um, yeah, and we got a few funny looks from the public. But there you go. <laughs> yes. So for someone starting out right at the very beginning. Um, mm. With invertebrates, you've give, you've given an idea of some of the uh, kind of good groups to start with. But what resources would you recommend um, people go? Like some of the people who uh, might be helping us identify season age challenge um, records, for example, um, who might just want to know start how to find out the difference between beetles or bugs and flies and bees. Where would they start there? There are um, some some handy guides to insects i would i would probably recommend uh go, go and buy a, a simple general field guide they um but w when you do that remember that a field guide to insects of britain can only give you an idea of what you've got and it can't mm -hmm. cover all the species but if you want just want to get to know the general feel of um the different sorts of families that are there are in beetles the different um orders there are like what's a stone fly what's a mayfly then uh, a basic guide, a field guide, um, will help. 
the the downside of that is because there are so many species, then that, that those guys can't cover everything. There, there are some recently there, have, there are some photo guides that are quite good um, to cover British insects. So if you you know if you look for uh, guys to British insects, I think there's one coming out which is soon, which is going to include spiders and some of the other groups as well, the, the sort of non insect groups. So a general guide can give you an idea. When you're narrowing down to a group, and if you want to know a species, then that could be an additional jump where you need um, other additional resources, or you can. There's lots of uh, opportunities now to post pictures online if you've got a picture, or you know if you've got a specimen and you could photograph the specimen, or you might have photograph something uh, live in the wild. You can post those things online, um, like I spot I naturalist, and people will help to give you. Um, an identification or narrow it down. So the, the the landscape now is vastly different from when I started in entomology. But the, the the resources there are, the opportunities there are with digital photography and with um, the internet are are just much better. There's a lot of good Facebook groups um, for different insect groups, invertebrate groups. Um, there's quite a few organisations um, recording schemes out there. So um there's, there's a lot of opportunities to go and ask people that there didn't used to be and to to get yourself into it and depending on what you're looking at they can advise um so for many insects uh, a photograph will give you an idea of what it might be but won't tell you what species it is mm -hmm. um but then people can advise you on that uh depending on the group so I would that would be my sort of recommendation to start with, and then how the, the responses you get and the the types of uh, insects or organisms that interest you, you will sort of find a route to take it further. Um, there's lots more resources to, to go into more detail. Um, you know, if you want to do that, I, I know some some people don't like taking specimens. Um, there are groups you can study that don't require taking specimens um, if that's something that you're not comfortable with. But for a lot of insects, if you do want to take it to species, you, you may need a you may need a voucher specimen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's about finding kind of what groups interest you and kind of what sort of level you're prepared to identify to. And then, um, yeah, then uh, yeah. finding the groups uh, that maybe uh, can support you in that kind of learning journey then. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a question come in from Savita, and I think it's related to your PhD research, actually, because she's asking, mm -hmm. is it common for, um, or how common is it for invertebrates to be only found in one part of the UK? Uh, it's, it's, it's not that, un well, it, it's not that unusual. I mean, if, if you, Okay, you've got it. You've got it out against the background of there's a lot of um, a lot of species out there. Um, so you do there are quite a number of species that you do find in a very restricted area. The, uh, the the subject of my PhD was a tansy beetle, and it's so it's a beetle as the name suggests. It feeds on tansy plants. Now, a lot of people describe tansy as a weed. Mm. So you know the food plant is not the resort is not the limiting factor in this in the ecology and distribution of that species. So there are other things at play. There's, um, I mean, there, there are a number of, of things that have been found in Britain in only one or two locations. Um, sometimes there are things that have may have only been discovered there um, in in that one spot. Sometimes it's species that were more widespread and have declined. And if, if you do get into insects and, and similar groups, um, but there, there are issues about declines and health of the environment and whatnot that, that you will uh, become aware of, um, uh, which, which is, is actually another reason why it's you know, important for people to go out and, and look at wildlife and, and record it and study it. But I think there's... I think we have about 250 beetles in Britain that haven't been seen since the 1970s. Gosh. You know, British mm. species. So that's that's the sort of, um, you know, 
but that, that's the situation that, that we're in. So it's not it's not that unusual that you will have species that are have a very restricted distribution. And just just to say, with the going back to the tanda beetle, um, I was I studied the population around York, and um, the, the beetle can be quite abundant, um, you know, around York. So mm. it's got a very it's very restricted uh, geographically. That where you can find it, you can find it in good numbers. Uh, so when I was at the same time as I was doing my PhD, so there was someone at Leeds University who was studying some leaf beetles, and I think he had three species he was looking at, and and one of them he never saw, because they they were, you know, they also had restricted distributions. But unfortunately for him, they were also really difficult to find. Uh, Whereas I was quite lucky where the one I had restricted distribution, but quite easy to spot it when it's there. Handy, yes, I suppose uh, that's another issue with uh, recording uh, species. Do you, are they actually kind of really rare or are they just ones that are very good at hiding or don't come out or don't live in places yeah. where people look for them? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, re record, recording effort. Um, is is something is something scarce because it hasn't been looked for is is a, is something um to be aware of as well uh there's a there's a really sort of strange looking millipede that occurs in kent and ah. it was is a polyzonium it's, it's it's a weird thing it looks it looks a bit like a cross between an earthworm and a millipede it's quite quite odd uh, and it's very distinctive. So, you know, when you see it, you, you don't really mistake it for anything else. That that millipede was thought to be in decline um, in Kent, and it was potentially going to be given some, uh, you know, conservation uh, resources put towards it. Mm. But in actual fact, the, the reason why it appeared to be in decline was because some people, some students had done some research projects on it. They finished their research projects so you had a situation where um, there were lots of records of this millipede in Kent, uh -huh. and then all of a sudden there were no records. Um, and that, you know, that looks like a decline, um, but it wasn't really a decline. It's because they hadn't been studied because they, um, uh, the, an organization I'm, I'm in the British Mary Port and Icepog group, they actually took a trip to Kent to check mm -hmm. and then they found it and they found, well, it's, it's doing okay. So you have to yeah, think about recording when you think about records and the number of times things are um, found and discovered, you have to relate that to recording effort to yes. have an idea of what, what the real picture is. Yeah, that's a really good example of how the kind of the context around records and the importance of kind of repeat sampling um, mm -hmm. in order to kind of inform conservation decisions. Otherwise, we could be kind of putting resources into things that don't need it and other things get left out. Yeah, and, and that was, that's quite an unusual example because mm -hmm. in most cases now, they they like to um, review species based on, based on declines. And for most insects, you just don't have that data mm -hmm. uh, as well. So it's, it's actually unusual where you have... Um, quite a lot of data for, for a millipede like that. Yes. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so more record, that's another reason to do, uh, for more yeah. people to get involved in recording. So um, these volunteer uh, recording uh, societies have got a great place to play and they're kind of not just finding new records, but going back to old sites and re resurveying perhaps. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, we, we are very um, lucky in this, in this country that there has been a history of, mm -hmm. of recording uh, and it's you know the, the vast vast majority of it is voluntary um, but when you look at other countries um, you know uh, s s some of the Scandinavian countries have got you know quite good for um, recording um, some groups in, um, and there seems to be quite a bit of activity in say Belgium the Netherlands as well in some groups but when you compare Britain to other countries we are way ahead um, that doesn't mean uh, the situation is amazing. Um, for some groups, it was, some groups we have a, a, a good uh, range of data. Um, for other groups, we have not so good. That 
really depends on how um, easy that group is to survey and how um, you know, some are more charismatic than others. That's that's always going to be the case. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, we are in a bit much better situation than other places, but still a lot more to do. Yeah, I'd like to hear a bit more about your millipede recording scheme. So how can people get uh, into identifying um, millipedes in other groups? And how would you recommend people want, if want, people want to learn more about those? Um, well, uh, for, for, for millipedes, there's a millipede um, centipede and isopod group. Uh -huh. And um, we're uh, three three recording schemes associated with that. I, the, I'm not actually in the military. I don't coordinate the military recording scheme. That's that's other people do that. But um, I'm I'm actually I'm actually chair of that group, and they have a very good website, lots of information. So if if people want to check the website out, it's, it's BMIG. Um, just Google BMIG, and you'll you'll come up. Um, against that, they've got a species list, they've got photographs of the different species, distribution maps, um, quite a lot of uh, links to papers. Uh, so it's, it's, a very, it's a very good website. Um, but I, I got interested or involved in those groups uh, because when I was back in Edinburgh um, in, my, in my local record centre, the guy who ran that centre, he was interested in... Um, you know, recording stuff that some of the stuff that's common and you can tick off um, relatively oh, easily, you know, should record that. So he did a crib sheet for the wood lice. So uh, we have, I mean, there's a few wood lice in Britain. I think it's the round around the 50 mark species, but there are five species in particular known as the famous five that are really common mm -hmm. and abundant. Um, and so I, I used to look at, you know, record this famous five group um, along with other people from the record centre. And then if you find some, when you get used to that, those five really common and widespread species, then when you start to see things that are different, then that's quite easy to pick up once you've really, you know, really got into the common ones, the, the odd ones um, that are easy to spot. Uh, now, when you when you start looking at woodlice, then you start turning over stones, and there's a suite of invertebrates that kind of come together. So the millipedes, the centipedes, and the woodlice are often recorded together. Um, they and I, I actually so I got interested in woodlice first, and there are some resources for that. Um, there are some keys available. And then about uh, about ten years ago, twelve years ago, the um, uh, a key to the British centipedes was produced, mm -hmm. uh, an ABCAP key. But there was a, a much older out of print monograph to the British centipedes, which is, which is you know good but not really available. So I got into centipedes, and then as a result, I've you know gradually got into millipedes. Um, <laughs> too. So yeah. I mean, I mean, just recently, I was um, I was looking for something recently, which I've got some pictures of. If I can, I'll try and share. Yeah, please do. Yeah, try and share a, a screen. Should be able to click the share button. I'm uh, rather fond of wood, wood lice myself, actually. One of my earliest childhood uh, natural history adventures is turning over stones in a building site and <laughs> looking for wood lice. Yeah, yeah, no, they're, they're a very, a nice group, very accessible group as well because mm -hmm. they're, um, you, you just have to pop into the back garden mm -hmm. um, uh, to, to, see, to see these things. And, okay, I, I, the screen sharing doesn't seem to be working. Ah, oh. oh, that's a shame. I was hoping to. Okay. Yeah. Um, but, Maybe but, you can describe your, your finding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but there's a there's a there's a project um, 
that the Natural History Museum is involved in the Darwin Tree of Life project. And um, we're, we're collecting invertebrates and sending them on to the Sanger Institute who are um, making full genome sequences of, of these uh, different invertebrates. So there was a millipede that I, I know is in the wildlife garden um, of the Natural History Museum. So I, so a couple of weeks ago, I casually popped down. Um, this thing is about two centimeters long um, and it's sort of very pale, more or less white. Um, so reasonably and reasonably thick. That that sounds. I mean, all millipedes are long and thin, but you you get different. Um, yeah, chunky ones. <laughs> you know. when you start studying them. Uh, so and and I popped down and I, I knew there were some of these by the compost bins in the wildlife garden and I just thought yeah I'll I'll just grab a few and I was in a bit of a rush and just so did it quite quickly and popped back to the office and then it was only when I got up to the office that I realised well these things have got eyes now the species I was looking for does not have eyes ah <laughs> so <laughs> it was a, so then I thought well I I don't actually know what I've got um, and then. Uh, so, so took them home and actually ended up um, lo looking at them in more detail at home. And it's um, a different species, which is a scarcity in Britain. Um, so, that, so that was that was quite. And I'd never seen it before, so it was quite nice for me to find it. But what's interesting is that you know people have been recording. Um, mm. in the wildlife garden for yeah. 25 years now. Yeah, it must be one of the most w recorded scraps of land in the UK. <laughs> yeah, possibly. And and this has not turned up before. So it begs mm. the question, well, um, what what's it do? You know, has it been missed? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, poss it's possible it might have been missed in, in 25 years if it's been, you know, maybe it was uh, deeper underground. And what, where I found it, there's a population I found a few, um, but it it is it has raised some questions, and we've had some uh, you know people who are very adept at millipedes, um, you know, well before my time, who've been looking mm -hmm. around in that area. So it would suggest that it's may it may have been missed. Mm -hmm. It may have come in. If it has come in, it's probably um, come in a short while ago, enough for there to be a population there. But I do know in the wildlife garden, they're careful about bringing things in or not. So, you know, they, they have that in mind that they, they don't want to. I mean, the, the garden was created 25 years ago, but, um, you know, they, they manage the vegetation and they're careful about the providence yeah. of anything they, they plant in there. And they only go for, they, they focus on native species. Um, but the, philosophy has always been to sort of manage the flora and then let the fauna do its thing yeah, yeah. so i mean that we we found but then you know thinking about that we've we've turned up about i think six to eight species new to britain in the mm -hmm. wildlife garden um now part of that is undoubtedly because there's um, a lot of boffins in the museum who might go and pick things up in their lunch break or whatnot. Um, but that, you know, that, that can't be the whole picture. There's, there must be, I, I don't believe that a, a small corner of an institutional building in South Kensington is a, is a magnet for international wildlife. There's, there's um, obviously movements of things going on um, that uh, we probably can't completely understand but mm. you know the, the more we look the more we'll pick these things up yes yeah maybe these things are lurking in all our gardens and, or sides possibly, of the road yeah. <laughs> possibly there's one um well, one millipede that's on the british list uh which is a it's a species that's found on in sort of mainland europe so it, it is a you know it's, it's a european thing it's not some species we get in this country are you know, may have come from further overseas and mm. have arrived in or in a glass house or, you know, the Eden project is, is has a few interesting tropical things in it. But there's there's one species on the list which 
you know, by, by rights, um, is in the right part of the world, but it's only ever been found in one garden in Norfolk. Mm. And um, I think that the guy said he had, he had a particular piece of wood in his garden that he would turn over, and there would usually be one or two of these <laughs> millipedes under this like one one bit of wood, and then you could put it back again, and you know. Uh, apparently he's lost a bit of wood. So, uh, <laughs> so you know that I, I'm sure that species is still there. But then you think, well, it must be in his neighbour's garden. You know, where else is it? It's mm. uh, so the yeah. I I think I I would I would like I would love to see sort of just more recording. Uh, yeah. general recording i i think it, i mean we all as I've mentioned in this country we already do quite a bit but if you rack you know could rank up the recording by say a half an order of magnitude we'd i'm sure we'd pick up a lot more interesting things mm. i but i i feel that i've been involved in some projects where you your project is focused on quite a rare species you, you go looking after this sort of rare thing and i mean half the time or more than half the time you miss it um i think that like more just general recording yeah. will pick up these things if we could you know um increase the effort somewhat well, okay so you heard it here that's a nice thing to end on so get going and recording in your local space and who knows you might end up finding species new or add some new dots to the map and even if you don't have a garden or green space yourself you can help us out by having a look at the some of the sightings that were made for this year's city nature challenge on iNaturist. Uh, there's still time to help with identifying them up to midnight on sunday the 9th of may so thank you very much duncan for coming along and chatting to us yeah, about your okay. it's fascinating to hear about uh, that's a new millipede in the garden. Of course, I've missed that. I've not been in the museum much lately, sadly. Oh, it's, it's uh, yeah. only, only two weeks old news. So. <laughs> ah, so yeah. stop press. <laughs> yeah. And thanks everyone for listening. And uh, um, you can have a look at uh, the, any talks you might have uh, missed uh, on the UK Bioblitz Facebook page. And happy um, wildlife hunting and bioblitzing, everyone. Thanks for coming. Bye. Okay. Okay.